welcome to my second video game critique. Now, I know that you guys were expecting me to have a horror-only channel, but honestly, I just take ages to put videos out. I actually enjoy just about every genre. So how about this for a change of pace? A critique of ukulele. A video game that can easily be classed as an adventure collectathon platformer that was released as a result of a solid drought in the genre and massive levels of excitement across an entire fan base. The genre itself was a fantastic romp through colorful, vibrant worlds with characters that reflected that. The part that could be considered almost a surprise was that they contained within them potentially challenging gameplay in terms of platforming and time trials. Ultimately though, it was hitting that 100% that was the most challenging goal considering that it would often drive you through every single mechanic and visual delight the game had to offer. The reason I enjoyed this genre so much was the satisfaction of approaching a world at my own pace, knowing that my choices and speed were my own, to get immersed into a completely fictional yet very welcoming world and beat every last challenge the game threw at me. Sadly, they became less and less popular, so now we've lost the chance to play the potential innovations that may have occurred over the years for many different franchises. Though this series is about a new game, a game that would like to remind us of those times and present a brand new experience that could have gone alongside the others of that time. Not necessarily in terms of any mechanical or functional restriction, but in feeling. In experience. And did it do that? Well, I imagine many are curious already as to where I fall on the spectrum of loving or hating this game. And I guess what I will say is that the point of this video is to show exactly what the game is, not what I personally think it is, but I'm gonna throw that in as well. If you'd like to skip the introduction and move to the beginning of the analysis, then please click to the timestamp I have displayed on screen right now. If not, here is my introduction. Caution. Spoilers for everything about ukulele ahead. It has been made clear that Playtonic are going to provide some significant updates to the game further from this date, so I can only say that my video will be accurate from the month of June 2017, I guess. But if an update comes out for it post that, then there will naturally be inaccuracies in this video. However, I am critiquing the product that was provided on day one. I'm going to do my best to focus on the game itself and only reference other titles or the industry itself when I feel I have to because context is often very important. So when I originally streamed this game twice, I didn't realize how bad the bitrate suffered and how much quality was lost due to its beautiful goddamn colors. So when I recorded it locally, it looked a hell of a lot better, but it managed to actually cost me a few frames here and there. So since my machine isn't actually quite good enough for it, 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 it is a shame, but I'm, I'm, I'm making it clear that there are going to be some, let's say, inaccuracies and, uh, and misrepresentations in terms of how the game runs and how the game looks. I would say that it's more important to listen to what I say as opposed to what you're seeing in certain moments about performance because, well, it's different for everybody and uh, my machine's not perfect. So aside from the primary evidence I have collected, I have once again checked out the community's perspective on this game, hence the statements I made about liking it and um, hating it. Hello my wonderful friends, I'm D-Pad Gamer. I'm Peter from What Culture. Today I'm taking a look at Platonic Games' ukulele. How's it going guys, I'm Vivi, and yes, I'm finally back. Okay, so this is going to be my live review for ukulele. GameX presents another episode of Before You Buy. Hello you, it's Alex from Nintendo Life here. Just kidding, it's Josh Thomas from the BitBlock. I don't know why I did that, um... <sighs> Where to start with ukulele? Ukulele is the very definition of fan service. Breaking news from Moist HQ. It's raining tears because ukulele was incredibly fucking disappointing. Spoiler alert. Where ukulele went wrong? It's on the fucking shitty side, I'm sorry guys. Is ukulele the game to revive 3D platformers and bring them back to the forefront of the industry once again? Or... Is it just another kickstart failure? What a false fucking dichotomy. Anyway, this helps me to frame a better video covering the topics that I think are important and what others think are important too. For example, there are trends I've been noticing in people's reviews. If there's one thing you might know about me, it's that platformers are my favorite video game genre. Banjo-Kazooie is one of my favorite games of all time. This review is coming from a guy who grew up with Banjo-Kazooie. Let's make that clear, alright? Banjo-Kazooie is one of my favorite games. Banjo-Kazooie in particular has always been a game that stayed close to my heart. Banjo-Kazooie was one of my favorite games as a kid. 
And that's why I wanted to play the game for myself, because, you know, I'm the platformer, man. My favorite title was Banjo-Kazooie. And I wholeheartedly believe that Banjo-Kazooie on the N64 is my favorite game ever. Banjo-Kazooie is a great game. It's one of my favorite platformers. I'm a massive fan of 3D platformers, and I'm very fond of the Banjo-Kazooie series. I've also played a good amount of Banjo-Kazooie, which is important since this game is heavily inspired by that. Okay, so I guess I need to have played Banjo then, right? Well, I played Banjo-Kazooie to 100% for the first time about a year ago. I, I first played it about three years ago, thanks to a friend pushing it on me. And it is now one of my favorite collectathons. So I backed Ukulele for £10 and got a copy promised to me when it releases, which was like two years later or whatever. For this series, I hit 100% another two times on Banjo, just to make sure I understood what I was talking about a little bit better. And I played Ukulele to the boss three times and to 100% two times. Everything you'll see is from those collective playthroughs. Now, in defense of Banjo-Kazooie, as someone who has no feeling of nostalgia for it, I think it holds up fantastically well. The camera turning in increments and getting stuck on things here and there is one of the few tiny issues I have with the game, and overall it could have been released today as a strong indie game, and I would have appreciated it all the same. I think that dated may be a word that is thrown around a lot as a criticism without people really understanding what it means. Games evolve, as we all know, whether it's with additional options or an ergonomic and mechanically friendly controller, or because new ideas sprout from older and clunkier concepts. Take, for example, Castlevania on the Nintendo Entertainment System. There is a jump option that essentially forces you to go forward or back in a strict arc. This arc cannot be changed from the moment you engage it, and when you are platforming, that can be impossibly unfair, or completely fair, depending on your perspective. Every single game that involves platforming in this era of the freaking universe that I know of allows you to control your jumps mid-jump. This makes for a much more responsive feeling of breakneck decisions in mid-air that can decide some of the most intense gaps in the game's platforming. At this point, if you were to play with this scheme from 1987, you would likely feel like it's restrictive and simple to the point of being completely unsuitable for modern sensibilities and gaming in general. How about the controls for GoldenEye on Nintendo 64? Not many can play that game at this point and actually say that it's good. It has been completely outdated by modern controls. Similarly to any game that controls an FPS with tank controls, they simply do not compete with modern mapping. And who knows, maybe in the future gaming with a controller or a mouse and a keyboard will be outdated and we use everything via our virtual machines. The point is that collectathons cannot be outdated. Genres don't get outdated like mechanics do. Even text-based adventures have their place in modern times. They simply adapt to account for new tools they have at hand. The only thing dated about Banjo-Kazooie is its graphics, and even still the game can be quite beautiful to look at. Overall though, it kicks some major ass, especially for its time. Now it's become obvious that people don't like it when I criticize other reviewers, but it's gonna happen in these videos and I guess I'll try and be nicer. Conversely, I don't know how many of you guys watched H-Bomber Guy, but he got a little bit lambasted for his criticisms of Matthew Matosis as of recently. Matthew is still trying to use the lock-on mechanic in fights, even as late as the Watcher and Defender bosses, and he's still using a shield. Aw, oh, bless. Someone really liked the previous games and tried real hard not to unlearn what they learned there. And to be completely honest, I found it refreshing to see a person who is far more successful than myself actually levying criticism against other critics in the same way that I do, even if he clearly went a bit too far sometimes. Similarly to me. Still, H-Bomb's Dark Souls 2 video was fucking nonsensical. Anyway, as everyone probably knows, John Tron was removed from the game because he said some stuff that was poorly worded as fuck. Wealthy blacks also commit more crime than poor whites. That's a fact. Wait, what? Platonic's decision to remove him was their own, and people have their own right to demand refunds. Ultimately, it had no effect on my desire to play ukulele, despite my love for JonTron and his content. Other than that, I, I literally don't give a fuck, but I figured it needed to be mentioned, because it's some kind of elephant in the room. So, what was promised on the Kickstarter? Well, I read through a hell of a lot of it, and there's not much that stands out to me in terms of a lie or a crazy promise. The main message they have is their intention to create a spiritual successor to our most cherished work from the past, and that they believe they have captured the spirit of those games. The one thing I did find interesting is the statement that you can explore more than five distinctive worlds. Now I don't know if the hub world is considered a world like the rest of them, but there are only realistically speaking five worlds in the game. However, more worlds will be in the DLC for the backers and they have made clear with what is currently 52 significant updates to the fans since the launch of the campaign that they are more concerned with releasing a playable game before releasing every piece of content. 
and they will be doing everything they can to complete these things, including but not limited to providing content free of charge to the backers of the game in the future. Regardless, the main aim of the Kickstarter was clearly completed and this would be an example of fantastic service for many, despite the frame rate issues on certain versions of course and hanging loading times I've heard about, but nobody's game doesn't work whatsoever and as far as I have heard they've provided almost all backers with whatever they should have been rewarded due to their pledges. This is pretty incredible considering the sheer volume of backers there were for this project, but seriously, good on you Platonic, this is great work and this is the kind of thing we should be encouraging as a community or a, um, well, industry consumers. The most interesting part to me is that there is no promise of resurrecting a genre or revolutionizing a long forgotten gameplay phenomenon, or evolving the 3D platformer as we know it to a modern stage. Not that they haven't done any of those things for certain, but I couldn't find those promises fucking anywhere. They wanted to make a spiritual successor to Banjo-Kazooie and Donkey Kong Country, so let's see how they did. One more thing before we begin, however. The Unity engine, an engine known for its incredibly simple and free access, known for being responsible for many games that are considered shovelware at no fault of its own. Why the fuck are people picking on it? The Unity engine is responsible for Hand of Fate, it's, it's responsible for Pillars of Eternity, it's responsible for Hearthstone, it's responsible for Rust. This engine is brilliant for development. It is free, it is easy to use, and it expedites the development process. I am sorry that there are bad games made on it, but that doesn't mean it is a valid criticism whatsoever. But the weirdest thing about it is that ukulele is actually gorgeous. This game looks beautiful, especially considering it's built in the Unity engine. Boogie, Ori in the Blind fucking Forest was made on Unity. That game is beyond gorgeous. They announced they're using the Unity engine, which is the engine you make the fucking Donald Trump game with. Yes, Dunkey, because it is free. You know what else was made using Unity? A little game known only as, um, <clears throat> Hollow Knight. No, it doesn't seem like much of a shock considering the others I've mentioned, that another gorgeous and fantastically tight game like Hollow Knight was created on Unity. Dunkey probably didn't know. It's not like he's played Hollow Knight. Hollow Knight which has raised the bar for Metroidvanias to infinity. I mean, you just gotta feel bad for anyone trying to follow this shit up. Good luck. For real, good luck. Well, that's just fucking embarrassing. Anyway, it was made clear in fucking 2012 that Platonic were highly interested in Unity. So implying that it was some sort of bait and switch, cop out move is literally just dishonest. But it does a good job of supporting the narrative, so why the fuck not? Regardless, let's get into this. If you're new to my format, I split the game up into very broad segments and present everything I found while playing with a touch of feeling on top. This one is gonna be long, folks. I ran this on my personal computer, a relatively powerful one with no lag or stutter issues when playing without recording. With recording it has a handful of issues and whether or not that's an optimization issue or just my specs not being up to par for this game, who knows for sure. The point is that the game ran extremely smoothly and consistently at the base on maximum settings. The settings are however very lackluster in terms of video options for a PC built game. I haven't ever really been a stickler for settings, but it is clearly a fucking problem if you can't change graphical settings while you're in the fucking game, and the fact that the voices don't have their own slider is heinous, but hey, we'll get into that. Ultimately, you cannot edit visuals while in-game to your preference, and this forces multiple starts in order to commit to the preference you actually choose. The only other thing I kind of want to cover in this section, however, is arguably quite a big one. Uh, I'll play a simple montage for you, and you can try and guess what I'm getting at. What wasn't appreciated was the occasionally wonky camera. The camera is a complete mess. The camera deserves some criticism. But the camera in ukulele a lot of times is broken. The camera can be a little wonky. The camera in this game is also pretty miserable. It's everything we all expect from a bad camera at this point. Jittery, inconsistent, hard to control. You need to be able to control the camera and have full control over the camera. Whereas in ukulele, it can have a mind of its own sometimes. Then there are the countless times when the camera sets you up for failure. The camera, for example, serves as a constant and painful reminder that some elements from the Nintendo 64 era should have stayed there. The camera is pretty bad. The camera is also a bit troublesome. For the camera, there is nothing good I can say about that bitch. Because the camera is often very uncooperative. The camera's broken. It's literally yeah. broken. The camera gets stuck on walls, so it won't let you turn. Camera, 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 cam
Right then, what about this bloody camera's functionality? Ukulele has become very controversial in judging its camera effectively. People are providing at most one or two clips of the mechanism failing to prove that it is terrible overall. Some don't even do that, yet they all feel as though it's an objectively terrible system. In my first run with the game, I encountered problems. In my second run, I identified what those problems were and really started to notice them, and a friend pointed out a very significant issue with the camera. Thank you for that, Mr. Cancilio. He's probably watching this video right now, that faggot. Here is a rundown. The simple fact is that cameras in video games get given specific or general rules to abide by. One of the most common is the autocorrect feature that will drag the camera to face whichever way you are heading in the world itself. This is incredibly common and the positives far outweigh the negatives. Ukulele has this system and it works perfectly fine. They, however, have another form of autocorrect, a far more sinister one. You cannot escape the camera with relative ease. This is a new form of autocorrect, or, well, I haven't got a game in my mind off the top of my head that I can reference with this system, but I'm sure one exists. Basically, the camera will make sure you are visible on screen as much as it possibly can at all times. On paper, this sounds like it could be quite effective for you, but it is far from it. This will make the camera fight you. It will take the control of the direction you wish to turn the camera and decide what is best for you now. If you take a single sharp turn behind a wall or go beneath any kind of object, this camera will frantically attempt to find you at all costs. This can easily result in death because the direction ukulele will take depends on not only the direction of your primary analog stick, but also the direction your camera is facing, otherwise known as your secondary analog stick. Only in this case it isn't always you that's moving the stick. The camera will frantically search for you when you are off screen. This is a sequence without me touching the camera at all. I'm, I'm not moving the analog stick that controls the camera whatsoever. When the camera moves, so too does the direction your characters are rolling, running, or even swimming. This can drive you off cliffs. The idea that you should not be prioritized on control of your camera ever in a video game is terrible, but there are certain caveats such as in Dark Souls, where you can use the patented claw hand to strafe around your enemy to have access to your fighting actions and control your camera freely at all times, though you will have to compensate for a slight pull, which is serviceable. But ukulele doesn't have a slight pull, it has a jarring yank that in the right circumstances can cause your death. The next system in place is that of snapping into position. There are several points in the game that require a wider view in order to operate the minigame in tow. The camera will accommodate this by moving into position, but this can occur at points where you really never want it to. This will happen whenever you pass these areas, and it makes the entire experience frustrating because the camera's taken away from you for a moment to show you something that not only do you not want to look at, but you actually want to walk away from. That level of control for the camera going to the game is already something that's happening in the other systems. Conversely, the snapping will actually override the system that wants to ensure you're on screen at all times, and will allow you to be in positions that mean you can't see yourself whatsoever, as long as the snapping thing is actually happening. But, making a return as it does in seemingly every third-person video game, the camera will get stuck on objects that exist within the world. The biggest issue I found with this was that if you go into your first-person perspective and try and aim up, you will actually hit the ground to the point in which you need to move back so the camera can slip past the edge to see what's up. This is... ridiculous, and I wish we could move past it in modern gaming already, but cameras are seriously a tricky thing. Now, this would be totally fine if the camera angle wasn't facing straight ahead so that you can barely anticipate the logs, that is. Why wouldn't they make it so we are looking at a similar angle to the ramps? Now, many people have been complaining that the camera does not zoom out enough when dealing with the Great Rampo boss fight, and that they cannot see the logs coming down, and thusly cannot possibly prepare to dodge them. While I will be explaining far later what many people didn't understand about the mechanics of rolling and ukulele that make this fight trivial, I will also say that I cannot take this criticism seriously, because anybody who even watches Rampo's three phases for even a moment would find that he has a strict pattern for all three. Seeing this would imply exactly where future logs are going to be, and regardless, you can actually see them on coming. It is far from difficult to prepare accordingly for this. The actual issue with the camera during the Great Rampo fight is that it'll drastically change angles based on a very narrow borderline and if you pass through it by accident and try to correct yourself, you'll find that the camera will have a stroke. It is incredibly annoying, and it isn't restricted only to the Great Rampo area, but that isn't everything. The camera will also decide to trail off at seemingly random points. It gets distracted or caught on something, and the previous system of being so obsessed with rescuing you from being invisible is now abandoned. Ultimately though, the camera just fucks up sometimes. Sometimes it just doesn't behave, it wanders off and breaks all the while trying to desperately decide which system should be dominant right now. 
The poor thing is dragged all over the place in aid of the player, which has ironically caused it to be something of a liability during gameplay. But it would be completely unfair to say that the camera is broken. The camera is not broken. In fact, the camera is able to follow you incredibly well, making use of all the systems in place. In fact, if we mosey on over to my total game time in ukulele, we can see that I'm essentially at 100 hours of gameplay, and I have what is essentially a minute of footage to show you of the camera fucking up in total. So let's be generous and times that footage by 20, and say that is the total of camera fuckery, because why the fuck not? That means a grand total of 0.37% of the time spent with the camera involves issues that frustrate and annoy me. Also, mathematicians are welcome to check that out because it's probably wrong, but you, you get the point. The fact is that you fight with the camera quite a bit in the game, and that isn't great to have to deal with. It would seem that Platonic have tried to devise a way for the camera to be a bit more advanced and have ended up creating more issues than usual. However, there is something daunting I have to tell you, folks. Cameras in third-person games have historically been pretty fucking terrible. Dark Souls drove me insane in many battles due to the focus system dying on me in moments that I desperately needed it to function. But I'm sorry, the monster just jumped right over to you and now you're gonna have to forego focus or have a fantastic view of your leather-clad legs. Ultimately, they could have gone the way of creating a silhouette on the wall, you end up going behind to circumvent the view like in Mario Sunshine, or hell, they could make objects and structures fade when you're behind them. Though, each of these can result in horrible mishaps, and they don't like it when us players can see into their games anyway. Even though there actually was an instance of the camera doing just that to me in Galleon Galaxy, it's actually kind of interesting because it, it happens here, but it doesn't seem to happen anywhere else. I personally feel like the camera was fine, and that it had a handful of issues that were easy to overcome and calm the fuck down about. It would seem to me that people have been massively overreacting to the camera issues because of a handful of bad moments without really considering the environment we're in and how cameras actually work. However, the facts are all there, so judge the camera as you wish, folks. You know, it is a strange thing to have barely anything to say about a subject as large as graphics. This game is bloody gorgeous, the cartoonish wonderland of simplicity and magic is maintained throughout the entire adventure. The more interesting part is that the main maintenance of these themes is supported by many realized elements that represent the world around them. I believe Donkey said that there weren't characters matching the worlds they belong to, or not enough of them. And he couldn't be more wrong. The game has characters that fit the respective worlds perfectly, and this fits with characters that appear throughout a selection of the worlds that visit for work or vacation. The fact is that everything blends together with a beautiful sense of purpose. This doesn't mean that there aren't uglier things in the world. For example, there are a set of coins that appear in Capital Casino that just look so lazily placed like a stretched over JPEG. Despite the fact that there are pretty good looking coins later in the game. Perhaps that's a part of how Capital B wanted that to look, I don't know. But there's no denying that there are some ugly textures. However, you shouldn't take my word for this one because everyone has a different perspective and I guess this is one for the subjective books. Besides, I can't show you how good the game actually looks because of my recording, so yeah, j you know, just, 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 just judge for yourself. Both sides of the ukulele war have decided that these are points they're going to die on, and as far as I'm concerned, you can call the game ugly and ill-fitting as you want, or you can say it is the most gorgeous game in existence. Either way, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, I suppose. But you know what isn't? The weirdest fuck shadows in this game. For some reason, and this mainly happens in the opening level for my playthroughs, but basically, as you cross through any of the natural occurring shadows in the game, you'll be visited by this ominous shadow. This thing was extremely bloody distracting to me when I was playing the game. When I was streaming it, people were speculating that it was like a draw distance issue, port incompatibility, and generally just glitches in general. I don't know what causes this, but please get rid of it. It's weird as hell, but honestly, the graphics function just fine for the most part, and um... Sort of the shadows, in fact, and they're a boon to the experience overall, or, well, they should hopefully be, but there's just that weird issue. So, as the story goes, Yuka and Lely discovered a book called The One Book, or 
something like that. This book has golden pages, and Laylee's practically convinced that it's worth a pretty penny. Meanwhile, Capital B and Dr. Quack are busy activating the Novelizer 64 to steal the world's books in an attempt to get the one book, as it will allow them to rewrite the universe. I don't know, books are fucking broken in this world. As the book is stolen, most if not all of the pages fly out all over the world, and in order to gain access to the building that the book is being held in, Yuka and Laylee must collect at least 100 pages and fight Capital B to get it back. Once Yuka and Laylee manage to defeat the final boss after traversing each of the worlds, talking to their inhabitants, and collecting the required amount of pages. They seemingly sort of are okay, and then Blasto shoots them into a book and everyone lives happily ever after. So the story is absolutely retarded and silly, but who the hell cares? Getting invested emotionally in this world would have been a crock of shit regardless, but nothing in it follows any semblance of universal rules, and you regularly engage in property damage or murder to receive your pages. The story is absolutely serviceable for the game, however, at hand it serves as an effective vehicle to contain the mechanics and the world required to create this game. But there are a handful of notes. Dr. Quack admits that he's been sent to monitor facts and trivia by the bosses. Now, it isn't a huge leap to assume that Platonic want to populate potential future games with these bosses, but I love the idea that they decided to try and explain away the reason for the quiz section by making Quack the trivia monitor? You fucking what? Not to mention the random appearance of Blasto to serve as a way to cut the loose and awkward end of both the villains just standing in the room with the heroes with nothing to do. This screamed of being rushed, which is ridiculous because it's so bloody simple. Just end the boss fight by slamming capital B into a book and Quack escapes to tell the bosses what's happened? Why bring in Blasto? What is even the point? Why does this bother me so much? Someone's defense for this was literally, Blasto is in the beginning of the game, it makes sense that he would turn up. I just, I don't, no. Look, I don't mean to be rude, but this doesn't read like it was made for kids. It, it, it reads like it was written by kids. You beat the bad boss man and then he gets up and the other boss is also there and then a self-aware cannon fumbles into the room and blasts both bosses into a book prison. What? It doesn't matter though. The story doesn't matter a fucking all. It, 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 I just found this funny. That's, that's all. And to be perfectly honest, well, we're out of time. You see, these videos are going to be at maximum half an hour, or they've probably tipped over it in some cases. And we're going to be covering literally every facet of this game. Despite the fact that it may have gone quickly in terms of what we've covered so far, we're going to be getting very in-depth into how everything works and everything this game has to offer in the future segments. I don't want to scare anybody, but this is probably going to be a, let's say, seven-part series that will be around about three and a half hours long. We've got a hell of a lot of stuff to get through, but, um, you know, thank you to all my subscribers who've been waiting for these videos to finally surface from my computer. But as you know, it takes bloody ages. As we go through this series, I will be covering everything about this game, and obviously we are covering some of the smaller stuff currently. Next time, I'll be jumping into a rather controversial topic, and from there, who knows? See you next time, folks.